Welcome, welcome. Rick Helps Real Estate Show. Real Estate. What's my name? Rick Helps Real Estate. We've got Dan Frio on here. Dude, that um, intro is awesome. Yeah, isn't it great? It's cool. I, Pat made it. We have Pat. What's my Rick McMaster's on the bottom? No, I'm kidding. Pat didn't make that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Wait, we got Jason okay. Maggard up in the Northwest chiming in here. So we we've got uh, we're circling the wagons here, folks. Welcome. So I uh, thought I'd. So you're out there in Chicago, Dan, and it's not cold, huh? <laughs> it's no. That's what we were just talking behind the screen. It's like I was kind of showing them the trees around my my house. And it's like one of the, you know, three months that you get to come outside and enjoy the weather. You know, not like you guys where it's 80 degrees, you know, 12 months of the year. We have, you know, this little time frame and it's like, woohoo. <laughs> so I got I home, was, cut the grass and do a bunch of honeydew stuff. I put a hat on yesterday and I, I got a little convertible and I was out with my GoPro and my doing a, a neighborhood tour video of yeah. uh, Gilbert. Probably going to come out Sunday night and, and I'm. I'm like all sunburned back here. <laughs> so it was a great day. It was about 80 or 90 or something like that. But, uh, but we're going to be not even talking about the weather in about a month. We're just like, you know, it, it's going to be awful, but I thought to get, I'm seeing some stuff and Jason and I were in a conversation, uh, via text the other day and, uh, the top end of the markets getting a little, uh, feeling a little bit of, pricing pressure are you guys seeing that at all pat might be a good pat which, what are you seeing out there uh you know yeah i mean on the on the i mean on the jumbo side and the yeah i'm, I'm going to share some numbers on what's going on in anything above one or two million and uh you know it's it's um jackie's on speak of the devil I mean, um i never i don't honestly i usually don't our loans like right now i have a uh, uh, probably the, the half of my files uh, are about seven fifty eight hundred, and then the rest are probably three fifty and under. And that that that's usually the bread and butter. I for some reason I, we we don't get a lot of you know one two three million dollar deals. I don't know well, why. I mean it's um, I we don't either. My bread and butter has been like three fifty to eight seven fifty eight hundred nine hundred. You know you get maybe a million once in a while you get a, a million million two million three. But I mean, um, I have you know, from a price standpoint, I don't know, from a mortgage standpoint, I mean, I've seen once again, we're still I don't think a lot of these people are just paying, you know, if you've got a couple of different businesses, my feeling is they typically just pay cash if they can pay cash because uh, they're like, I've got the problem is they've got maybe three, four businesses. They got 15 different tax returns and they're, you know, I don't want to I don't want to go through the hassle. I'm just going to pay cash. That's what I've seen. I, I go through the MLS. And I look at these one and a half to two million dollar transactions. I'd say. Nine out of ten pay cash. I mean, the smart people when they're when they're when the rates were down at three three and a half, the smart people are buying a million and a half two million dollar home. They're taking out some type of mortgage because that was a good way to leverage your money at three percent. But yeah. now it's seven seven and a half. People I think are just paying cash. It's That's funny. You, it's funny you say that because I do have a, a one at one point two million, and the the gentleman has eight properties, two or three businesses, and it's been a challenge. And this is probably the sixth or seventh deal I helped him with. And uh, every every time I do it, he's between, you know, he sold these two properties and he just bought this one. And it's kind of a moving target all the time. And it's really hard to, you know, narrow down his finances. What I think happens a lot of times, Rick, is I have a couple of buddies in the like wealth management pieces of banks and those banks will undercut everybody to keep make sure they maintain that that client, because yeah. if you go to another bank and get a loan there. Then most likely they're going to say, "Hey, we'll give you much favorable rates if you if you you know you put all your money here." So these these wealth management companies they don't want to lose your business, so they'll give you you know cutthroat rates just to keep all your assets there. Well, here's here's kind of a I'm not going to call this a canary in a coal mine, but here's some of the things I'm seeing. So overall in our market, here's our listing success rate. You put it on the market, how successful were you get it? And we're sitting here at at about seventy two percent in all price ranges. Now, if I filter this out and I'm going to go um, 1 million and is over 2 million. Is this national or local to you? This is local to me. Okay. Now I'm at 65%. So the listing success rate is not as good in that price range. I look at the Cromford market index and it's, you know, down here, it's kind of starting to 
Uh, they're starting to kiss in the middle here. The demand is kind of starting to slip down. Supply is starting to go up. It's very subtle. Um, but this one is, this is really a, um, an eye catcher here. This is our price reductions overall, the whole market, 2,402 price cuts. And it says here, um, let's see when I click on it. I, now I'm going to go, so you, you can, all you can do here is compare our, our price cut to where we were. My red pen's not working. See how that is? Pat, did you touch my computer? <laughs> oh. So this is where we're at with price cuts here. Obviously, this was when interest rates went flying up, right? So everybody panicked. The, most of this was driven by iBuyers, by the way. Um, but now if I take the price range and I kick it up again and I go to um, above 1 million, boom, 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 all the way up over 10 million, take a look at the number of price cuts now. I mean, they far exceeded everything that we saw over here when rates went flying up. Now, these guys are not affected by rates, but there's an astronomical amount percentage-wise of price cuts in the higher end in Phoenix and Scottsdale. How's uh, the, is the inventory gone up or gone down? Is there just less to pick from? Yeah. So let's look at the new one. So here's, um, well, let, let me go to inventory here for a second. So, cause that's a, that's a great question. And I had it, had it up there. I'll go active listings, medium here. And, uh, um, this is where we're at. We're flatlined here. Okay. 15,885 and compared to last year, at 12,856. All right, so let me filter this out again and let's go in the high price ranges and I'll put this above 1 million here and we're just going to compare it to last year. It's considerably higher. Last year we had 1700, this year we have 2578. Not a big number, but uh, they're operating on much higher higher numbers. Now if we look at the 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 actual Crawford market index here. Now that the high end ones tend to be Fountain Hills and Paradise Valley. And you can see that it's still a statistically was supply and demand to seller's market. Um, and they've actually had a couple, you know, good weeks there. Chandler continues to lead the pack. But when you drill down and start looking at the pricing and like Jason says here, listing success rate under 60% above 800,000 here, price cuts galore on the upper end up in the Pacific Northwest. We're seeing the average list price per square foot. Overall market here is pretty much flat. It's been that way through Q1, right? Now, mm. let's look at the average price again uh, per square foot and <coughs> filter out all the other prices. <coughs> Above well, one the one thing I would like to stress is, thank God none of us are in the range of buying a $10 million home. <laughs> <laughs> They're flat, too. <laughs> well, they're not, they're 682. So they're, they're not listing. I mean, higher let me ask you in the first quarter. <laughs> let me ask you something too. Just Rick, this is just general numbers though. But I mean, if you're listing you know, a lot of times I see these homes that are listed for 2 million, you know, they just don't drop it five or $10,000. You know, they drop it from 2 million to 1.9 or 1.8. Well, that's, you know. that's true. But then I mean, you don't have a $450,000 house. You see from 450 <laughs> down to say, 445, 440, but you know, it's but this, all this chart isn't tracking the amount. The chart is tracking how many. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's how many units are actually reducing their prices and it's, it's higher than the rest of the market. Yeah. So it's, it's just anecdotal. Um, you know, is it the canary in the coal mine? Um, you know, I mean, I'm seeing fatigue out there, buyer fatigue. Um, you know, I can't afford it. So, I mean, if I want to buy, I can't, um, I'm just tired. Um, and I'm just, and I'm waiting, but at the same time, the market's still doing relatively well in some se segments of the Valley. How, how much appreciation did that specific area that you were looking, how much did it have say in the last two, three years? Um, it's pretty substantial. Uh, I think it was in probably 40%. I mean, yeah. some of these be so much in the money that I'll take a $300,000 haircut because I'm already up a million and a half. Well, and then now on the flip side on that, you see, you still see the, the articles and the YouTube videos about how many homes are going to hit the market and people that bought in 2022 are going to be upside down. Now I've moved a lot. I don't ever remember going, you know, sitting there and 
going, honey, start packing. I just checked Zillow and we're underwater. Yeah. I mean, you, but, you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's kind of, I had a debate a couple weeks ago with a, a gentleman, you guys, you probably saw it, the, the economic ninja. Economic ninja. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, well, there's a, there's a battle. We have battle videos coming up, so this was ju- that was just a warm up. But he, you know, he was trying to make the the uh, the analogy or the it's fact is you know the houses that were built you know the last 10, 20 years they didn't go anywhere. He said so. You know the inventory shortage is it really a shortage and so forth. So then then you know my counter and this is what more videos are coming is is basically going to be well you have we have hi rick here if you're thinking about locating to the phoenix area or any of the surrounding communities don't forget to punch that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so you can be up to speed on what's going on in our market jessica and i are happy to help anybody that's looking to relocate to the valley of the sun all of our contact information is in the description below people getting born we have immigration we have illegal immigration Mm -hmm. um you had just the the non-documented immigration. I'm not I'm not going to go political or anything on that. There's been a you know it's it's basically in the mainstream media. There's about 11 million undocumented people here. That's more than probably half the states in the whole country. Yep. The people that are coming here, you know, they're working, they're getting income, they're living somewhere. You know, <laughs> maybe they can't get a mortgage, but they need a house. So do you get where I'm going? So it might be, you know, that that's you, you look on the builder side, they're building uh, they basically doubled down on investment property building for, you know, they're not building for people to buy and live in. It's basically these complexes to rent and for investors. You know, maybe there's something there. It's like if you got millions of people coming in each year that technically truly can't buy a home, yeah. they're gonna rent. So Yeah, you know, I, I Dan, I totally agree with you. I mean that Rick, remember I've talked I talked about that kind of brought that up six, seven months ago. Remember with um, when we had Barry Habib on? Yeah, yeah. I brought, I mean, I brought that up to him. I go, you know, you don't, you never hear, hear that topic about housing and the immigrants, you know, whether they're legal, illegal, they're, they're we illegal. Have of, we have a lot. Huh? <laughs> they're illegal. They're just, they're, well, I'm just saying, Justin, not, not, to, get politi- it, not to get political, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just saying you give a call it what it is, but we've got 10 to, Whatever number they say, 10 million people, 11, you know, they say 10 million. I, I would be a betting man. It's probably 15 million. Those, all those people, all those people are not living on the streets. And that's right. been my biggest thing the last year, Dan. I totally agree with you is that that's put pressure. I, mean, I don't care what you say. That's put pressure on housing. We didn't have that pressure 15 years ago, 20 years ago. They're, they're living somewhere. And if they're, they might not be able to qualify for house, but maybe they can. Somebody can get a runner in. They can if they get a job somewhere and they're paying. You got Joe Smith who's got a house. He can rent that house for X amount of dollars, and they can put their family in there. They're going to do that, that. Nobody. I've never heard anybody the last year and a half really come out and say that publicly. You never hear that being talked about at all, yeah. at all. I mean, it's never. It's kind of like this hidden. Like, why is this housing supply? It's it's a pure supply. To, you know, you've heard me. Harp 18 million times is supply demand. And um, we've been under, under, you know, built since 2010. And you add that along with the immigration issue. I mean, that's, that is really the, the, the impetus for everything. And well, take um, a look at Austin, Texas, when you're talking about supply and demand and people say, well, it's not supply and demand. Uh, you know, it's, it's greed. Austin, Texas home prices have been coming down. Why? Because that's one of the few cities where the builders really ramped up. I mean, and they ramped up quick and they've got a lot of room to build in Austin, Texas, and they did in Florida as well. Um, so those two markets are seeing downward pricing pressure because they finally started building homes. Seattle, there, there isn't a lot of places to build homes up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Seattle's suffering from affordability and fatigue. Phoenix, we're building, but we're still behind. But unfortunately, Chandler, they're, there's no room to build in Chandler. There's barely any room to build in Gilbert, Phoenix. Forget about it. Hardly any in plus or, you know, um, what I want to say, infill. infill um, so yeah. it's all happening on the far west side of the far east side. So, you know, it's it's a, it's a challenge. But it it it's harder for us to build up the supply in our core area than it is in some areas like Austin, Texas. Well, even like um, I, it, we... We never have huge fluctuations in our home prices. 
we're usually four or five, six months in a year, and it's been that way forever. We never went up 10, 20 percent or whatever. They're building like crazy out here. There's a lot of immigration coming here as well. But there's a lot of people moving, you know, to Illinois. I don't know why. But I go to Florida quite a bit, and that's that's a tricky area because I just I'll be I'll kind of candid on this on your show. Um, I have a condo down there on the beach. And I just had to pay $65,000 special assessment. Uh, oh, oh. My association fee went from 500 to 600 to 900 to 1300 And it's tough. You know what I mean? But I like where it is. The house is basically free and clear. So I'm fortunate there. But all that other stuff is just it. it but the, and the values are going up like crazy. So um, it, that's one of the reasons I think. You know, Florida, I get a lot of business in Florida. The homeowner's insurance down there, if you can get it, is absurd. I mean, it's three, four, five, six thousand for a home. um, And if you can get the the insurance. So that's one of the big things. You know, I have to agree with a lot of people that say Florida is is suffering. If you're on the coast in Florida, yeah, you have your values. I mean, I just got my the unit next to me just went up for sale a hundred and. 20,000 more than what the house, the places were two years ago. Um, but I'm just kind of throwing, you know, the different parts of the, the country are, are facing, you know, issues. But here in Illinois, honestly, we have the second highest tax rate in the whole country. But housing is just, it's stable. You know, we don't have, whip, you know, those whips up and down. Mm-hmm. Well, well, speaking, speaking of, of whip, can I just talk about real quick about that immigration thing too, Dan? Um, a lot of lenders, which you didn't see four or five years ago, is a lot of, a lot more DACA loans and I-10. Yes. I mean, I-10, you know, basically, individual tax that. identification number where you basically, it's not a social security, you don't need a social security number, you need I-10. So yeah. I think a lot of the immigrants are kind of getting around. There are ways to get into a house. Yeah. If, you know, for, you know, they're I making just got, a lot of programs available. I got a person that just graduated college going, has a sweet job at Google on an F1 uh, visa. Yeah. And it, it's fine. You know, and I, I kudos to the, to the the kid. He's he's amazing. And, you know, I'm I'm glad for him. Um, you know, there there are opportunities out there. People come. I I still think you know a lot of people are coming to this country for a better life. There's a lot not you know just for the drugs and everything else. But yeah. you know, they're coming here. I don't think they're coming the right way, uh, but they're coming here, and we're not yeah. doing anything. And they're going to have to live and they're going to work. That's that's also if you start looking at the you know you you monitor the Fed what the Fed's doing. And inflation's coming down, but they, they're still hell bent on we need four percent unemployment. Well, if you have like I, I'll agree with Pat, if you have fifteen million undocumented worker or p- people here, probably half of them are working. So that's seven and a half million you know people adding to the workforce, kind of behind the scenes. So you're not going to have this jobs report that just you know kind of plummets. Um, because they're, that's what's keeping the job forces going. And it, most of it, if you really track where that those jobs are going, it's hospitality, which is very well needed. But as you know, they're not well-paid jobs unless you live in California, making, you know, 100 grand as a, as a hit on minimum wage out there. But Yeah, yeah well, you're yeah. making it, yeah, that minimum wage uh, until that restaurant shuts down. Um, yeah. Renters need to make $80,000 to comfortably afford a typical U.S. rental, according to Zillow. Where in New York? I don't you know. know. It, you know, this is Zillow. Okay. Um, yep. said rents grew almost, you know, 0.6% a month. Um, so it's saying that, uh, meaning spending no more than 30% of their income, they'd have to make nearly 80,000 a year. Five years ago, it had to make more than 60,000. So I don't, that's their national right. average. I'll bet if you took New York and San Francisco and LA out of that, that number would change well, radically. <laughs> yeah. It'll, well, so that's what it's tough. You can, you can use any statistics to argue your, you know, th- that's what I try to do on my show. A lot of times I try to show here's the facts guys, but you can cherry pick all this shit out here that you want and just prove a point. But it's like, I try to just say, here's the facts. I, I don't care if you buy a house. I don't care if you rent, I don't care what you do, but here's the facts behind all this. That's all I want you to have. True. Yeah. True. I mean, so, so rates, let's talk about it. Look, a fairly decent week yeah. um, today, but everybody's kind of sitting on their hands waiting for CPI next week, right? Yeah, I mean, we're going, we're, you know, bottom line is we're going from headline to headline every week. I mean, right now we we had the market this week. I mean, we saw it, bonds improved. This is price. Then we saw a little down day through Wednesday. And then Thursday, yesterday we had a little 
nice little move up. It just, but if you look at it from start here, <laughs> and this is, <laughs> Dan will appreciate this. I mean, you get a client that calls you on Monday, you know, for a rate quote. And this is why when you compare rates, just FYI, you should be calling within the same day. Because if I quoted a rate today or somebody quoted a rate today and Monday or down here, and, and they called me the following day and rates, you know, came down because this is op inverse relationship. I'd be like, oh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm about an eighth better, you know, yeah, it's probably, you know, cost wise, a little bit better. It make me look better here. But then you call the next day, they're here. Call the next day, they're here. So, I mean, this is pretty much just to give people a rundown. Let's say I quoted seven and three quarters um, here. Rates got better. You know, seven and three quarters was par with no buy down. But then all of a sudden rates got better. I'd be seven and three quarters, but I'd be able to give you like a seven, eight hundred dollar credit, nine hundred dollar credit because it rates improved. If they got worse, you know, that seven, eight hundred dollar credit might turn into a cost of three or four or five hundred dollars. So the interday, the interday movements within the week are just going to be the cost. It's not going to be the rate. The only time that we have a we've only had these moves every, you know, Dan knows that once every quarter we have that one day where it's like, holy crap, we had a couple, you know, last couple months where it actually the rate will move from seven and a half to say seven and five ace on a daily basis. So, but you know, overall, I mean, they started here and they ended here. So you can tell it's pretty much almost a straight line this week. Um, you know, we got, we're going, you know, just based on the headlines, we got, we got a lot of fed speak coming out. We had some fed ghouls. We came out today. Next week, we've got another, we've got a round of guys, you know, fed the, Paul is speaking on, on uh, Tuesday, and then we've got a round of uh, speakers, uh, Kashkari and Bowman, all these other Fed chairmen, they're speaking on Wednesday, and you got another one. I, got, I think you got some more guys on Thursday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're going to have guys, one guy saying we should, you know, hang tight with rates, and other guy's going to say we're going to raise them. So it's going to be a volatile week next week, um, you know. So, but overall, we're stuck in this range. I mean, you look back, I pull back over here. Um, this year, I mean, this is we're, this is kind of a range right in here. I mean, it's up and down, and you know, if somebody buys a house and goes under contract for three for thirty days, you know, a good mortgage guy will say, okay, hey, we can catch maybe a little break on rates the next couple of days, and maybe save yourself a couple thousand dollars by watching the rate. But overall, we've been stuck in this channel um, of of you know, it's just a, been a channel, and there's nothing we can do about it until you know we got good support though. We'll see what happens with this. They say there's going to be cuts in September. I, I'm still – I'm going to put a dollar say that my bet is I maybe one cut if none. That's my that's my prediction. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> I, what I just posted – it's funny you, you said what you said. This week, um, it's been all about the Fed. You know, Monday comes in and you, there was that spike uh, that on Tuesday. What happened on Tuesday was Kashkarian. You have to pay attention. I have two, two or three videos out uh, between today and tomorrow – you have to pay attention to what Fed speakers talking. And, and here's mm -hmm. what some are doves, some are hawks and some are neutral. So uh, basically make it simple. If I say you're a hawk, you always want rates to, to go higher. You're like, oh, it's rainy out today. We better increase rates. You know, if you're dove, you always want rates to come down. If you're neutral, you're just watching the data. So on Tuesday, Kashkarian came out and he made a comment. Well, you know, if the data deems it we will increase rates and the just markets went to crap. You know, every the rate spiked out, the Dow Jones, everything tumbled. The next day, the whole opposite took effect. And then yesterday, we had some actually good news. There was a there was a the bond market. There was twenty five billion dollars worth of bonds issued uh, yesterday. And my concern that it was too much for the market to handle, and rates were going to spike up. And the market's okay. very well. So that was kind of a who for mortgage rates uh, this week because it was. You know, there was a lot of dynamics behind the scenes, but the, the, the bond auction went pretty well and we had rates come right back down in line. So but it's it's basically every day you got to check where rates are. And like Pat said, if you get a quote, even if you get a quote in the morning, by the end of the day, your quote might not be worth a darn because rates. I mean, we've seen days where rates go up a quarter percent in one day. Well, I mean, those, are, I mean, those, those are crazy days. Those I'm, I'm going to call days. Pat in the morning and say, Pat, uh, what's my rate? Right. And that's going, well, you know, let me check, do this, you know, and, and, uh, and figure out and tell me, well, this one's going to, you're going to get a credit $800. This is that. Okay, great. I understand my rate. And then the next day I, I call you Dan and you're better. I'm like, well, Dan's better than Pat. Yeah. Well, Pat got better too. Uh, so, you know, they, it's, 
they, I think I really want to encourage people to really understand how mortgage rates fluctuate yeah. and work closely with guys like you that, that explain, you know, that it's very fluid and sometimes the rate doesn't change, but more than likely than not the fees change and people mm -hmm. get quoted a rate at the beginning of their buying process. They're married to it, but they have no idea what's going on in the back end. That now when you go to close, it's going to cost you $2,000 for that loan where before it probably, you know, yeah. was you're going to get an $800 credit. Um, right. Well, I think uh, Dan, guys like Dan and I take pride in actually watching the market and trying to get, I mean, my goal is, you know, a lot of people think that we're adversaries, but we're on the same page as them. And, you know, back in the day, yeah, back 15, you know, back in before Dodd-Frank, yeah, you could, you could quote a rate and you could charge an extra couple points on it and, you know, get all crazy. But, you know, um, I take pride in trying to get people the best rate. I mean, I get paid – we're on a set compensation with the loan. So it doesn't matter if I get you six and a half or six, if I get you six, you're going to be happy. You're going to refer people to me um, versus, you know, I, and I tell people right now, we're not in a cocktail party interest rate environment. I mean, you don't go into the cocktail party and say, I got seven and seven A's today. You know, I mean, back when you were got, you know, two, you know, three, four years ago, you're like, yeah, I got two and an eighth on a VA loan 50, you know? Yeah. You're bragging about it, but I don't see anybody bragging about their interest rates. And I just tell people, Take bite it. It's we're in that environment. You're not going to brag about this rate and hopefully keep our fingers crossed. I don't guarantee, but hopefully in the next six, eight, nine months, maybe the first quarter of next year, rates will start loosening up. Another thing, too, is I tell people don't jump on the wagon the first rate cut because there's once we've been in this year and a half trend of increasing rates. And once we get the other downside, hopefully the trend goes the other way. You don't want to be that guy that goes from seven and seven ace down to seven to or seven a quarter to refi and then all of a sudden they go to six and a half and you're refining again i mean you want to i kind of like to take pride in saying hey i we you're pretty good with this rate let's do it now i want to address drake here and say you know i agree with you it's probably eighty thousand dollars a year to, to rent here in in phoenix and and louis says uh to afford an apartment in phoenix sounds right and uh yeah zillow I, seems pretty accurate to me what i was pointing out on zillow is this is a national survey so you pull out a few cities and that can, that can change. Are we expensive in Phoenix? Absolutely. Um, it's, it's really brutal. I was uh, putting the video out on uh, Gilbert and I pointed out just how many multifamilies you see projects are being built in Gilbert and how many are up there. So this could, this could happen uh, that, that we can see rent coming down, but we're not feeling it yet. Uh, um, you know, I know many who rent with less than 50,000. Yeah. They've got roommates. <laughs> I have a well, lot Dan, of people you know, that complain about, you know, I can't buy a house. I'm, you know, this, that. And then you find out well, when you're in Southern California where a starter home's 900 grand, I, I would never be able to move. I hate to say it. <laughs> you're gonna, I, don't, I don't have a Ferrari sitting in my garage because I can't afford one. And so I don't buy one, you know, but I don't sit there and complain every day I can't buy a Ferrari. You might have to move. And the bad thing is people don't, they, everybody wants to be politically correct. Well, unfortunately, sometimes it's just, you just have to say the facts and I'm not trying to. Well, my son, my, my son could move, but he'd have to change careers. I mean, he, yeah. he works in Burbank. He's an animator. Uh, animators don't make a lot of money, money unless you own the studio. So yeah. he can't, probably the only other place he could go is maybe Austin, Texas. Uh, but he said, there's not that much of, animation there some of these guys he says i've thought about moving to a lower cost area but he says uh the problem is when you're doing your own animation doing your own studio now you get burdened with having to fly other people in to help you on a project so he said so i don't i'm not sure if i'd be ahead if i went to like oklahoma um, not, i'm just saying it's but is if, he, if he's sitting there complaining every day that he can't live or whatever you have to get to the point and he's probably not doing that. And I didn't mean that with that. No. Way. Yeah, I know. I get it. It's like, everybody's complaining about this and that, and this, it's like, well, then, you, then don't buy it. You know, you don't have to buy. One thing I did want to bring up, and this is what's starting to concern me. And I'm, you know, me, I'm the optimistic person <laughs> markets and everything else. 
in the last couple of weeks, we've started seeing when I start seeing Starbucks earnings starting to not hit their targets. I'm like, hmm, everybody, everybody goes to Starbucks. And mm. then just recently you had McDonald's. They're coming back with a five dollar meal because their earnings are bad. You have Yum Brands. You have a lot of these other companies. Yum Brands owns Taco Bell, Pepsi and things like that. Now you're starting to see cracks in the foundation on people that are buying you know the the fast foods and things like that. When that bubble starts to crack, those people are they're they're out of money. Uh, even the Fed, you know, a lot of the Fed charts that we're seeing, a lot of people are in the lower income, mid to low income families. They're they're kind of they've depleted all their assets from COVID and all that. Now it's starting to move to the middle class. Now that's when we're going to start seeing. But that to me is telling me what the Federal Reserve's done and been doing is starting to take effect because I think everybody was just at that mode that they just buy and buy and buy and go and shop and go out to dinner every night. And it's coming to an end. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see that in Walmart data, too, where they track the grocery carts mm -hmm. and they track the uh, percentage of private label versus branded products. Yep. They're showing that more people are buying fewer branded products and opting out for private label, which usually happens when money gets very, very tight. And I mean, we're getting squeezed everywhere mm -hmm. the, at the gas well, stations, uh, you know, in groceries. So did you know. they increase to kind of pull all this money out of the system. And even Fed Chairman Powell years ago said, there's going to be pain in households. And now I, I, all that excess money is coming out. And now we're going to start to see that pain. So I, I think the Federal Reserve, they, they shouldn't increase. They're not going to increase rates anymore. But I'm, my fear now is they wait too long. And then now they're, you know, now they're talking other recessions and things like that. And that's that's not good. It's hard to come out of those. Well, we haven't seen a lot of movement in the bond market, like way up, way down. Like Pat said, we're kind of stuck in this doldrums in this zone. But it, it, I kind of have this gut feeling. Bond traders are humans too. That, that <clears throat> they're almost at the point to where if they see a number that they think is really going to affect things, that we're going to have it swing either way. So let's just say CPI comes out worse than expected this week. I got a feeling rates are going to fly up. Oh yeah, they are. Well, because you guys of the mood. <laughs> it might not seem like it's moving much but it went from four three i want to say mm -hmm. too long ago to about four six four seven mm -hmm. if you look back in history we we think of it today as these moves are yeah, they're just normal but i mean you go back you know five longer than five years ago i can ask pat how often did you see mortgage rates move a quarter percent in a month you know yeah. in the history that today it's like oh it moved a quarter percent today in history that's very rarely but now today we start seeing the yields i mean they're moving pretty bigger than we 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 expect you know going from the day to day but over like a two three week period they have this run you know we've had this run you know because we're getting you know high sixes and all of a sudden it went to like mid seven it's like half a point it's like okay that those are good runs i mean not day to day but you know, you give out a week or two week period, like, oh my God, rates are, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, but I think you know, the problem, you know, just make it just a general comment. I think the problem is with the home buyers. I mean, we've seen him, home prices, you know, go up 30, 40%. We've seen rates go from three to seven, but it's really what's compounded. You and I, Rick, talked about this earlier. What's compounded, in fact, is that their grocery, the average family of four or five, their, their underlying costs now are, average, are up about 15 or $1,600 a month. And that's that whole thing compounded. It makes everything just feel doesn't make you feel good at all. Another interesting observation, too. Uh, you know, Lisa, the other day told me that she a couple of days, a couple of ladies were um, talking um, down by where she works. She says they were talking about Sun Lakes and they go, can you believe how many homes there are for sale? And I said, it's it's um, perception. It's not reality. Home, Sun Lakes only had 65 homes. Normally, this time of year, they have 150. But because there haven't been any listings out there for three years, now when you got two signs in your neighborhood, you think yeah. <laughs> that there's a lot of signs. And I hear that all the time. Oh, I can't believe how many. Yeah. I mean, not, have you seen all the open house signs that are out there? I'm like, I saw three. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, we're still inventory is very, very low. But in your neighborhood, if two signs pop up, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel the same way in my neighborhood. If I, I see two or three, I'm like, Oh my God, what's going on here? Seriously. But in the past, you'd you'd drive past and you'd see 10 and it 
it's just normal, you know, transitory, like here, again, in Chicago, you know, it's, it's a lot of transitories in the suburbs, you know, you have people coming in and out for companies and things like that. So there was a house just down the street for me. That's funny. You said that Rick, they just went on the market today and it's stood out like a sore thumb to me. I'm like, Oh my God, they're moving. Wonder what's wrong. You know, yeah. <laughs> nobody it moves. used to just be an occurrence, you know? Yeah. So oh, Pat and I were talking about the, uh, um, bears bulls and pigs the other day should i and, ask yeah, well we we were talking about you know for example um oh i get what you're saying you, you yeah. know the bears uh, it's really bad out there the housing's not going to sell and the bulls are everything's going really good well the pigs are you know i listed my house and i got an offer but i think i'm a hold out wait for a better one so there's bears bulls and pigs did i yeah. get that right pat yep so you know, and pigs and get pigs, slaughtered. Yeah. Pigs and, get slaughtered. <laughs> well, how many people I had Axos, Mike from Axos Research, and they do they that I don't have you used that yet? Have you I, yeah, you, yeah, he's very good. Yeah. So um he actually he was on my show a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, and I didn't realize this. The average market has the norm is 30% uh homes have reductions. And it, it dawned on me when he was saying that. I remember I was on a show with all you guys at one time. And you know, everybody was saying, you know, when you're meeting with these buyers, they, everybody thinks their house is worth more than it is. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, we can list it at this price, but probably not going to sell. And it was funny because when he was saying that, I, your, your show kind of clicked in my head. It was like, man, that's exactly what they were saying. It's like, you know, most people right now, my neighbor got this. Well, <laughs> you know. They got it three years ago or two years ago when rates were three percent and they could afford it, you know. So, yeah, it's hard. It's hard when people see a price cut, um, convince them that the market's not crashing because right. you know he he had to reduce his price by forty thousand. Yeah, but he was fifty thousand overpriced, and so people yeah. don't, people are ignoring that. And so, yes, there are a lot of price cuts out there, but I think we're shaving off some optimism. I don't. The average sales price, mm -hmm. the contract price per square foot is, is not going down. It's going down a little bit here in our market. So I don't, I want to be careful there. We're seeing that, yeah. uh, you know, when we look at that, that chart that shows even the high end, you know, the past quarter, um, the, they're like up 15%. Um, but yet when now we're seeing a lot of price cuts coming because it's just what you said, Dan, my neighbor got, this yeah and so everybody shoots for i mean i do it you know oh yeah, Same. yeah I'm, you know that there you you know you're going to be going down from where you start that's the whole part of negotiations when you're selling a house you know how many times not often in you know normal markets are you people paying more than what you've asked you know but until you know basically the last couple of years when people are just buying stuff 10 20 i still i had a couple comments on a video i put out just recently and people were making comments and it's kind of cool when they do this it's like yeah my market is still you know they're still bidding wars so this the, yeah my neighbor just got 50 grand out over asking and this and that then you're like hey where are you so there are markets that are mm -hmm. you know hurting and there's markets that aren't hurting and that's the, the you know why why we do this every day did you see that zillow came out with a form for Agents and buyers, and they're they're jumping a the gun on it. Just to give you some history here, the uh, NAR settlement is going to require that before you can go look at a home for an agent, you have to have a signed agreement with them. Now, um, you can sign that agreement with them for a day if you want. You don't have to sign it for three months, six months. So Zillow came out with, because on Zillow, when you look at a house, you go, oh, I want to see this. Oh, there's uh, there's Mary. I'll I'll see if Mary will show me the house. You click on it. Well, now Mary's going to send you a form. Oh. And so Zilla came out and said, we have a new agreement that, you know, it's, it's to be able to show you the home, but on the form, the funny part is now they're saying it's agreement right on the form. It says, this is not a binding agreement. <laughs> what point? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. And, but it doesn't now, now the new changes are not coming the third week of July. They're coming the third week of August. And so everybody's trying to figure out it's going to be different per state. And the agreement's basically, you know, going to be formed out that said, hey, here's how I get compensated. And so it's going to be the summer of confusion. And yep. uh, and I don't see it being favorable for buyers, buyers thinking that, um, you know, that, that this whole deal is going to result in lower house prices. 
don't see it. Uh, but I see a lot of confusion when it comes to documents and paperwork. Are you hearing a lot of chatter out there in Chicago there, Dan, about that? Honestly, what I'm hearing and kind of even what I what I've stated is and Pat can probably vouch on this. Most of the buyers right now, I hate to say it, they don't have a huge nest egg for a down payment. So many are struggling for the down payment and closing costs. Many are getting the closing cost credits paid or closing costs paid by the seller with seller concessions. So my if you if you do this on a daily basis and you see as many contracts as I do on a daily basis, you'd, you're going to start seeing, well, the house prices are probably going to go up a little more from here because the sellers are going to have to issue credits back to pay, continue to pay both seller and buyers realtors. So you're going to mm-hmm. get concessions that are still going to be paying the realtor, but you're just going to have to push up the price of the house to cover that cost. So the prices of the houses are going to go up. We should have a very confusing time. I think yep. I'm just kind of sitting on my hands you know, until I see what happens in August. In other words, after all the rulings are done and after the local associations draw up the rules, then I'll go read it. All the forms that I'm seeing coming out that are pending now, I don't even clutter my brain with it. It's like, you know, hey, I'm just going to. I'll read that when it's finalized. <laughs> yeah. We can we can adjust quickly. We got uh, my mom wants to sell a family home in Naperville, Illinois, and relocating to Knoxville, trying to convince her to rent it. I'm uh, no. in Naperville. I'm in Naperville, Illinois. That's where my office is. Hmm. It's, it, it, where, where that person is, when you said Naperville, it's Naperville, Illinois. That's where my, my office is. I'll be darned. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people are choosing to hang on to their homes and rent it. Um, so I just, if if they do, you know, make sure they understand that, you know, sometimes that's a lot of work. Um, you know, especially if you're going to be an out-of-state landlord, you may be biting off more than what you really want to chew because, you know, those you have to have a very good professional uh, property management company look after it for you. Um, and, and, you know, otherwise it's going to fall on you if you live in Naperville. <laughs> <laughs> so I also read a statistic yesterday that 63% of potential buyers want to live close to their mother. My son's three miles away. Yeah. Well, you know, so they want, they want, uh, they want to be able to just go down the street and, and, uh, and get help with stuff from mom. So I didn't realize it was as high as 63%. Well, so, I wish I lived closer to my mom because she broke her hip this last Saturday. Now she's in the hospital. So I, I'm an hour away, so every you know I went up there this week, but she's got her next door neighbor helping her. But it ain't you know I'm an hour away from Chandler to Sun City, so it's it's kind of tough. Yeah, it's easy if you're close. Yeah, it's not easy if you're out of state. Unfortunately, I was out of state for most of my career. My folks lived in Squim, Washington, and I lived on the East Coast and in Southern California and here and so Virginia, West Virginia. All right, (laughs) a ten hour drive for me to to go visit my mom. 10 hour drive. Yeah. Boy, I I met some people uh, in Sun Lakes last week that were heading back to um, Vancouver, British Columbia area. And I go, how long do you take to drive up there? And they're in their late seventies. And they go, Oh, um, two days, two days. Yeah. We drive from Phoenix to um, Idaho the first day. And then from Idaho up over, the Washington Cascades, um, and up into Vancouver the next day. Holy it's 12 hours a day. And he goes, I said, well, I'm driving to Vegas uh, uh, tomorrow. He goes, ah, you'll make it in four hours. So I'm heading up to 93. What happens? There's an accident. The 93 is closed in both directions for two and a half hours. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I didn't make it in four hours. Tell him he was wrong. So, well, gents, next week's going to be interesting. Uh, I can't wait to see what what happens, I think, you know, we guess every week, um, you know, rates going to go up, rates going to go down. But I think the sluggishness that we're seeing in the market in overall, I think will continue as our wallets are being pinched. There's still areas that are doing quite well, like Chandler and Gilbert um, and quite honestly, Fountain Hills right now. And uh, so I don't see anything changing in those markets. But I think the people that can't afford to buy are still trying to buy right now. Mm-hmm. And the people that are priced out are just, I think a lot of leases have been re-upped and they're going to, this kind of happens in waves and they're going to sit it out for a while. Yeah. I, agree with you. I think people are just kind of tired. I think the first time home buyer is just kind of tired. You know, yeah. they're just, 
They're just um, I have okay. people just bowing out because they're like, I'm tired of the bidding wars. I'll put in a bid. I get out of bid. I put in a bid. I get out bid. They're like, I, I'm just tired of this, you know, and I'm not going to chase prices. Like, I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, that that's called that the year of the buyer beatdown. Um, yeah. Got got old. I understand that Massachusetts is still having massive bidding wars. Yeah, and uh, in the Boston area, I don't. I like Boston, but that's rough. Well, gentlemen, have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Maybe we might see you, Dan. We might not. But I'm Pat will be here. So. I, I greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, I, thanks, thanks for, having me. for dropping in. See y'all. Take care. Bye-bye.